First point, the term complacency uh, uh, about contemporary Australia is being used by a number of people. I, I, I discovered sort of once I decided on my title, um, Ross Garno speaks about complacency and contemporary Australia, meaning the slowing down of what he thinks to be significant, uh, the reform economic uh, process. Uh, recently, I've heard Lindsay Tanner speak about complacency, and he seems to think it's the psychological state that we've reached as a country which has had 20 years of unbroken economic boom. I mean by complacency something slightly different from both of those. I mean um, the, a complacency that has infiltrated what I always call political culture. I'm not speaking about the complacency of ordinary folk. Uh, I'm speaking about the complacency of the political culture which influences everything and everyone, but I'm not making a kind of complaint about the nature of Australian people. It's, I don't know uh, nearly enough about enough people to make that complaint and I wouldn't do it anyhow, it seems to me absurd. I'm talking about the, the political culture we live in, the nature of the politicians, the newspapers, the, the media and so on, which c come to comprise a political culture. Now, my argument goes like this. If we think of the last 40 years since about 1970, I think in Australia there have been two uh, clear periods of political culture. Um, between the early 1970s um, and about the mid-1990s, uh, Australia went through what I take to be a, a period of uh, quite intense self-criticism. Not to say that this is a dreadful country, but to say that there is in the tradition of this country many things that, for which we should feel shame and which we need to change. Uh, the the self-criticism was in part economic, and I'm not going to talk about that. It was to do with deregulating the economy, something which has now happened, something which I have to say I once opposed, but which I, in, I think my judgment was probably wrong in large part, not entirely. Uh, and I'm not talking about that. The two areas that I'm talking about, the first, um, Australia, Australians in, got involved in self-criticism to do with uh, connections of, or aspects, dimensions of the nation uh, to do with ethnicity, race. Uh, and the second form of self-criticism was in our relationship to what Robert Menzies once called our great and powerful friends, our relationship to the United States and Great Britain, United Kingdom. Let me say a little bit about both. To do with ethnicity and race, it seems to me the Australian political culture, and thus many Australians, came to see that there was um, a history which was regrettable and in some ways quite shameful. Um, the most obvious and largest was uh, the coming to terms with the um, uh, shocking uh, attack on the indigenous people that took place uh, the, uh, when the British settlers arrived, um, something that, uh, that many histories began to be written to describe the shameful attack on indigenous uh, life, which I think has never really recovered from that attack. Uh, Australians also, as part of, I think, a more general Western movement, had to come to terms with the racism that lay at the heart of the migration policy. It, it, it was once almost the most powerful bond in Australia was white Australia. And in the late 60s, early 70s, um, Australian people had to come to terms. I have to say that I think it's one of the most inspiring aspects of Australian life as to how that was not really a contentious matter, that the overthrowing of white Australia and the acceptance of a uh, racial uh, poli a, a migration policy which was strictly non-discriminatory without great uh, internal disruption to the society was one of the great achievements and I'd be very happy to talk about how I think this was achieved. Um, they also, uh, Australians in, in, a, in a slightly less 
uh, kind of serious moral mode, but one that was serious, came to terms with the fact that the idea of assimilation, that is the idea that everyone who was on the other side of the English Channel who'd come to Australia ought to become a kind of an Anglo-Australian um, in order to be fully Australian, that was also overthrown. And the idea that multiculturalism was a way in which uh, the, the um, dignity, really, of all the people who lived in Australia could be best, as it were, asserted, uh, came to dominate. And for a while, multiculturalism, uh, the idea that you didn't have to be a kind of Anglo-Irish uh, type in order to be fully Australian came to be a consensual value. So those were, I think, the three main ways in which the racial, ethnic uh, uh, questions began to be examined and some of the assumptions to be overturned. And we, there was a, a, a major movement towards reconciliation and self-determination. Uh, there was the end of assimilation and a period of um, multiculturalism. And there was a non-discriminatory <coughs> discriminatory migration policy. And these were big things, and I think they were all to do with self-criticism. In the other area, uh, all Australian governments, including even the Fraser government, uh, began to query the dominion or colonial nature of Australian foreign policy, the completely uncritical reliance upon the judgments of either first the United Kingdom or the United States, and began to move towards a foreign policy within the framework of the American alliance of something like middle power initiative and middle power interest. Uh, and attempted uh, and a rather international outlook to, to, that we could do some good in the world if we didn't simply follow a great and powerful friend. In the area of culture too, uh, one of the great uh, kind of essences of Australia was what A.A. Phillips called the cultural cringe. Uh, the idea that uh, nothing good really of, of, a, of a creative, artistic or intellectual kind could happen in Australia and if Australians were to fulfil themselves, they had to leave uh, to go to Britain or later the United States, um, uh, and that only if they made it there had they made it anywhere, something that the generation earlier than mine, I think, was uh, affected by and perhaps harmed by. What we had instead from the period of the late 60s, early 70s, was a, a, a full cultural nationalism. And that cultural nationalism, which, uh, it seems to me anyhow, was connected with one of the periods of greatest creativity, particularly in the popular arts. I'm still very taken with the Australian films that came from that period. The, um, uh, you know, the many um, Muriel's Wedding and, and uh, Strictly Ballroom, which are all very popular films, which had a quirky and a rather vivacious sense of life innocent, naive, um, uh, and I think uh, a very distinctive feel to them. I, I've, I think that this creative period came to its end, and it's, a, in, it's in popular arts, not the high arts, came to its end with the Sydney Olympics, which I think was one of the great theatres of that quirky Australian excitement and creativity. Paul Keating once said about the Sydney Olympics, which happened under John Howard, it's not the uh, middle of an era and not the beginning of an era, it's the end of an era. We won't see that kind of liveliness in the arts again. Anyhow, it seems to me that that, the, the, and so that's the first point I want to make, that there was this 25 year period of quite exciting, uh, creative self-criticism, self-questioning, hoping to reinvent the nation. Now, I think, and you know, you, you won't be surprised to hear me say this, that this came to an end in the mid-90s with the period of the Howard government. That, and I, I, I'll put things in a, in a different way than I've put them before. It seemed to me uh, three major features of the, the political culture on, under John Howard that I want to say are these. The first is that Australia shared in a, a, a triumphalism about not it, only itself, but about, and not really the West, but about the Anglophone West, about the United States, the United Kingdom and itself. We had triumphed in the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed, it was a totalitarian power, and what we had done was right and good. There's a sense 
and, and the, the, the kind of the key cultural moment of this triumphalism was an essay by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. We have succeeded, they have failed. There's not anything better than what we have done. I think that triumphalism was, a, was an Anglophone feeling and I think it was uh, very strong in this country as well as the United States and, and to some extent Great Britain. Secondly, the period uh, that I'm talking about from the mid-1990s was associated with new nationalism or new kind of patriotism, a militarised nationalism. Uh, what grew and grew and grew was the idea that Australia was defined from, f through its overseas military activities. Uh, what grew was the idea that Gallipoli was the sacred soil of Australia. It had always been there, but it became stronger rather than weaker with time. Uh, the idea that every Australian military uh, initiative since the Boer War showed us to be noble and good and fighting for the better world. There was what I call the militarisation of the national imagination, which was connected with our goodness and a failure of self-criticism, even in the wars that I think anyone objectively would find uh, difficult to justify, Vietnam uh, and Iraq in particular. So there was, I think, this new nationalism, mil militarised nationalism. The third element of, what I th of the, the stalling of self-questioning was the emergence um, in the Prime Minister and with a new right-wing commentariat, which hadn't really been at all influential in Australia before, you know the people of whom I speak, Andrew Bolt in this city, um, Piers Ackerman and Miranda Devine in Sydney, Janet Albrechtson for the intellectuals, um, uh, Alan Jones for the older people in Sydney and so on. But this right-wing commentariat, whose Prime Minister was John Howard, began to see in self-criticism un-Australian self-hatred, began to see in intellectuals a kind of... Um, danger to the nation, and so on, and began to, to say that what intellectuals and self-criticism did was threaten uh, the future of the country, and they backed the, what they would think of as the common sense of ordinary people. Now, that's the mood I think we've been living in, and I think despite the election of Kevin Rudd and then Julia Gillard, we still live within. One thing that strikes me is how little either Rudd, who I think really saw through this but couldn't change it, Gillard, who in some ways I think mimics it and is, is both puzzled by it but also mimics the mood I'm speaking about since the mid-90s, uh, how little things have really changed despite now three years of a different government. Now, I think that this um, mood, which I associate with complacency, uh, should have been really affected by three major world events. Um, and I want to speak about them. And what's really puzzled me and depressed me is how little we in Australia, but also the Americans, and to some extent the British, although it's a different question, how little we've reflected upon these events. The first, um, and it sort of changed my politics, the first of these events was the Iraq War, which was a consequence of September 11, but in which, astonishingly, a major military operation was initiated on the basis of, well, three things, fraudulent intelligence, as we now know, but also fraudulent assumptions. Two, the assumption that not only Saddam, the assumption that Saddam Hussein had mass weapons of mass destruction, fraudulent, but also that he would use those weapons either to launch a strike against Israel or someone else, um, an, an absurd proposition given the relative power of Iraq and Israel, or even more absurd that he would hand weapons of mass destruction over to Al-Qaeda something which was based firstly on a false idea of the relationship with Al-Qaeda, but also that he was a lunatic who would risk uh, his whole political regime if that handing over had ever been discovered. It, the whole thing was, a, was, a, was a, a, a castle of fiction. And yet we went to war, mil uh, millions of people have been displaced as a result of that war, between 100,000 and 500,000 people have been killed who would be now alive were it not for that war. 
And yet, it seems to me, in Australia, but also uh, in the United States, to a less extent in Britain, its meaning has never really been accepted. I think we would be thinking about whether uh, investigations into criminality were appropriate uh, if the penny had dropped about what that war had meant. I am just astonished that a war could be waged on the basis of false intelligence and false argument. And yet, when it all happens, there's no response. But uh, So, com new complacency, the failure to think about that. I'll speak more briefly about the second. Uh, the greed of Wall Street and the ideology of market fundamentalism threw the world economy into chaos a couple of years ago. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to understand it. I think I do have a grasp of what happened. Again, it seems to me that neither the greed of the financial sector, the astonishing sense of entitlement that Wall Street has to, to massive riches, nor the falsity of the idea that the market can solve our problems for us, this worship of the market, neither of these things have been interrogated despite the astonishing collapse of uh, the financial system of the world because of the uh, fantasies and the greed of the uh, masters of the universe at Wall Street. Again, I've been astonished by how little reflection that has caused within our society. <laughs> Most importantly, um, by now we all know uh, that the, well, I, when I say we all know, we all are in a position to know that the earth is under threat because of completely accidental, uh, no one knew that when they started burning fossil fuels that had taken millions of years to develop, uh, that the release of carbon dioxide would uh, create a warming planet which would in turn threaten uh, the, the basis of civil, the, the, the kind of environment that gave birth to civilization. By now, by the, by the, since the mid-1990s or earlier, everyone is in a position to understand this, that the Earth is under threat. Once no one knew, but we now, now everyone is, a, in a, is in a position to know this. What has um, really astonished me is um, the failure of all societies, but Australia is one at one extreme, to, to act in regard to this knowledge. What I want to say about this issue um, is that from my point of view, climate change is in some ways the simplest public issue I've ever had to think about from one aspect. Virtually all scientists agree with the basic physics. That is to say that the Earth is warming and that that warming endangers the future of the Earth. That there is a threat of, even a threat of the melting of the ice in Greenland in the long term, even the West and East Ant Antarctic, the release of methane gas from the tundra in Siberia, all of which will have a, dr a incredible effect on the, the heat of the, the planet. Uh, the, 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 ocean, the rise of the oceans, the, uh, the water that's needed uh, in India and Indochina and so on through the melting of glaciers. They virtually, everyone agrees, they only disagree about how long it might take and so on and, and, and exactly uh, what will occur as a result of global warming. But I've never known an issue so simple that we must act against it because everyone who knows anything about the science, almost everyone who knows anything about the science agrees with the basic physics and the possibility. On the other hand, I've never seen an issue more complex from a political and international relations point of view. Now, I want to draw all, all this together um, by saying this, that I think the, the new complacency in Australia is driven by uh, a simple thought. The simple thought is that nothing we do can have a del deleterious effect, a damaging effect on other people, other countries, other cultures, or upon the earth. There's a smugness which is now so deep that we cannot really believe that either intentionally or unintentionally things are imperiled. But it seems to me they are. Uh, 
for the rest of my life and for the rest of my children's life, the issue will be whether humans have the capacity to act on climate change, it seems to me. I don't think any other issue is even remotely as significant now as that one. We know that it's not going to be solved at the international level. If it's going to be solved, it will be solved first by nations taking actions themselves. It is perfectly true that Australia produces per capita almost the highest emissions in the world, but only one and a half percent of the global emissions. But unless, but that's, the fact that Australia produces only a small percentage is true of 150 other countries as well. Unless those countries begin acting and in what I call a benign domino effect, shame the two countries that really matter, the United States and China in particular, into doing something, we're sunk. And so what I'm saying in my polemical way today is the new complacency, the smugness of Australia, which is also a smugness seen in Anglophone countries and in the West, unless we overcome that, uh, to put it as polemically as I can, we're sunk. And so that's why in my Yarrabank speech today, what I'm appealing to everyone here to think seriously about is what, what they can do, what they can contribute to the growth of consciousness, uh, to, 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 to rising up against the newspapers that have columnists that pretend they know things about climate science when they know absolutely nothing, um, and to to turn to a trade unionist like Paul Howes when he says not one job can be lost if there's a carbon tax and tell him this is not merely wrong but an, an obscenity or to turn to the businesses uh, that think that they are not going to take any risks to their profits unless uh, if their profits can't be guaranteed for the future they won't co cooperate with the feeble attempts the Gillard government is making to do something on this issue. We have to have a change of atmosphere, and it seems to me that that change of atmosphere is connected to pricking the smugness and the, of the, um, the nation, uh, and more generally the West at the moment, and more generally the world. Thanks.